All right, engineers, in this video, we are gonna talk about the development of the muscular system, primarily focusing on the skeletal muscle system. Before we get started, please hit that like button, comment on the comment section, and please subscribe. Also, tell others that you know about this channel, bring them in so we can help them learn as well. If you guys wanna support us, down in the description box, we'll have links to our Facebook, Instagram, Patreon. Go check that out if you guys can donate. We truly appreciate it. All right, engineers, let's get into it. All right, engineers, so let's start talking about the development of the muscular system. Now, what I want you guys to do, if you guys haven't already, please go watch the development of the skeletal system because the path that we're gonna take in this video is the exact same. First thing that we gotta do is we gotta start talking about the muscles of the face, right, of the head and neck area. Then after that, I wanna start talking about the muscles of the trunk. Then after that, I wanna talk about the muscles of the limb. So we're following the exact same path of the development of the skeletal system. All we're doing now is putting some muscles over them bones. That's all we're doing. All right, so let's start with the development of some of the head and muscles like suprahyoid muscles. How does that happen? Well, here we have our embryo, and what kind of section are we looking at? You guys are gonna get real good at this stuff, right? So we're gonna keep reminding you, what is this edge here, right? That's our buccal pharyngeal membrane. This is our cloacal membrane. This is a what kind of section? This is our sagittal section. It's our sagittal section. And so which end is cranial? This is your cranial end, near that buccal pharyngeal membrane. And this is the caudal end, near that cloacal membrane, right? What I want us to do is to take a section at a particular part near that buccal pharyngeal membrane. What we're gonna do is we're gonna cut through this son of a gun right like this. We're gonna cut through there, through that primitive pharynx and we're gonna zoom in on it and look at it. This is what we're getting. We're getting this view of our primitive pharynx, if you will. So we're getting this view of that primitive pharynx. And what I want you to understand is the different layers of this primitive pharynx. <clears throat> So what happens here is, what is this membrane? This is the first thing I want you guys to know. We already kind of talked about it up there. Where's my marker? Here it is. This membrane right here, where you have the fusing of the ectodermin blue and endodermin green. What is this called? This is called your buccopharyngeal membrane. All right, so that's that point there where there's a fusing of what two tissues, what two parts of the uh, germ layers? The ectoderm and the endoderm. Then again, you have the ectoderm kind of lining out here, forming kind of this like ectodermal lining here, and mesodermal lining here, and then endodermal lining there. Okay, so green endoderm, blue ectoderm, and red mesoderm. What happens is that this primitive pharynx starts kind of undergoing this vesiculation process. So it kind of starts forming these like little vesiculations. And look what happens when it kind of forms these little vesiculations. It forms this very special type of pharyngeal apparatus, if you will. Now, when you look at this pharyngeal apparatus, you have this portion here, which is kind of like your arches. Right, so you have these pharyngeal arches, which are kind of going from side one end here to this end here. And filled in the core of that arch is mesoderm, on the outer part of it is the ectoderm, and on the inner, inner part of it is the endoderm. So this whole thing is a pharyngeal arch. What happens is the mesoderm within the first, second, third, fourth, and sixth pharyngeal arches actually undergo a differentiation process to make muscles of the head and neck, particularly at the suprahyoid region generally. So what are these pharyngeal arches? That is the important thing to know. So this first chunk right here, what is this one? This is called your first pharyngeal arch. All right, so we're gonna put pharyngeal arch here. These are pretty common sense, right? This one's your second pharyngeal arch. So second pharyngeal arch. Here, this one is your third pharyngeal arch. Now here's where it gets a little interesting. You have your fourth and you're like, whoa, what happened to the fifth? I go fourth and sixth, that's interesting. The reason why is you have a fifth, but generally it kind of digresses and actually disappears. And so generally at the end here, whenever you're forming your pharyngeal apparatus, you really only have a fourth and a sixth, the fifth digresses. So now we're gonna have the fourth and the sixth pharyngeal arch. Now, what I want you to know is that this mesodermal cores here, they actually are gonna be the parts that form some of the muscles. But there's also gonna be nerves that are gonna supply the muscles that are derived from these arches. What are those nerves? And that's what's really important because if you remember the nerve, you'll remember the muscles. 
The first pharyngeal arch is gonna supply the muscles. It's gonna become the muscles of mastication. A Couple other ones as well. But the reason why I mentioned the muscles of mastication is you guys can remember what nerve supplies that. That is cranial nerve five. What is cranial nerve five? The trigeminal nerve. The second pharyngeal arch is gonna be primarily making muscles of facial expression. And there is other muscles, but again, that's the big one because that's supplied by cranial nerve seven. The third pharyngeal arch is one muscle called the stylopharyngeus, but that is gonna be supplied by what? The glossopharyngeal nerve, which is going to be cranial nerve nine. And the fourth and sixth pharyngeal arch makes actually muscles of the larynx, the pharynx, and another muscle called the levator veli palatini, and that is supplied by what? Cranial nerve 10, which is the vagus nerve. So, what I want you to remember is the muscles of the head and suprahyoid muscles are derived from the what portion? The pharyngeal arches, which come from the primitive pharynx. So if you take a cut here at this level, you have the primitive pharynx, you have your mesoderm, they undergo this kind of vesiculation process where they make this core of mesoderm forming these arches. These arches will become muscles, but I want you to remember the muscles are supplied by particular cranial nerves. Next question that we have to answer is, what do these mesodermal cores become? What muscles do they become within these arches? Let's do that now. All right, so the muscles that are actually gonna be derived from the pharyngeal arches, again, what is that? It's gonna be your head and kind of like suprahyoid region, right? So the first pharyngeal arch we said is supplied by cranial nerve five. So what, from this portion, it's gonna go make muscles of a part of our face. These are gonna be your muscles of mastication. If you guys want to know them, I'll tell you them. I'm not going to write them down, but it's the temporalis, the masseter, and your pterygoids. You got your lateral pterygoids and your medial pterygoids. But those are going to be muscles that help and, again, are making part of our face. The other one here is there's what's called the mylohyoid. Okay, so this is your mylohyoid. Again, this is one of your suprahyoid muscles. Remember, I told you these are going to make muscles of your neck, but particularly suprahyoid. There's also gonna be the digastric. So your digastric, and particularly what's called the anterior belly of the digastric. And the last one is going to be what's called your tensor veli palatini, or palatini, however you like it. But again, these are muscles that are gonna be derived from the pharyngeal arches. The second pharyngeal arch, okay? So first was by cranial nerve five supplied. All these muscles by cranial nerve five. Second is by facial. So remember I told you the best one to remember is the muscles of facial expression. I am not gonna go through these because there's like a ton of these, okay? But all, most of the muscles of our face, right? Most of the muscles of our face are actually gonna be muscles of facial expression supplied by cranial nerve five. A couple other ones. Again, you get the suprahyoid muscles, right? What else do we have? We have another one, which is gonna be called the stylohyoid. So it's called your stylohyoid. And another one is called your digastric posterior belly. There is a small little other one called the stapedius muscle. Don't worry about that one though, okay? All right, the next one, third pharyngeal arch, supplied by the glossopharyngeal nerve. This is a tiny little muscle that's gonna help with the formation of muscles of the soft palate. This is called your stylopharyngeus, stylopharyngeus, okay? And then the last one is the fourth and sixth pharyngeal arch muscles, which are gonna be supplied by the vagus nerve. This is going to be a small little muscle that's again, near the actual uh, soft palate. It's called the levator veli palatini or the palatini, okay? And then the other muscles, they're a group of muscles. You have what's called your pharyngeal constrictor muscles, so some of the pharyngeal muscles. And if you guys remember that, there's the superior, middle, and inferior pharyngeal constrictor muscles. And then the last one is your laryngeal muscles, all right? So all those uh, arytenoids, the cricoarytenoids, the cricothyroid muscles, all those sons of guns are actually going to be derived from these arches. Now, if you guys remember, we talked about how we make the skull, right? We make the neurocranium and the viscerocranium, all those bones and cartilage and all that stuff. What are we covering all of that with now? The muscle. So you see how it's kind of layering there? So now we have all the muscles of the head and muscles of the neck, but what part? Suprahyoid, okay? That's gonna be from our pharyngeal arches. Now let's go ahead and talk about some of the muscles that are infrahyoid, right? Hitting some of those like strap muscles and then going into the trunk. All right, so we talked about the development of the muscles of kind of the head and neck, but just above the highway bone. 
Now let's go ahead and just keep going. Let's talk about all the rest of the muscles, really, <laughs> from this point. So let's start talking about some of the muscles of the trunk and of the girdles, okay? So particularly the uh, pectoral girdle and then the pelvic girdle. And then again, we'll talk about some of these inferior hyoid muscles and some of the strap muscles as well. All right. So first thing that I want you to know is when we start talking about these truncal muscles, we have to go back to our kind of embryo, looking at this thing here, right? So you're gonna see this kind of format a lot. So again, what is this layer here? This is our ectoderm, right? This kind of blue layer all the way around. And then again, if you come back here, what was this actual tissue here? This part of the mesoderm closest to the neural tube. So here's your neural tube right here. This one is called your par axial mesoderm. Do you guys remember what this chunk of mesoderm does on the sides of the neural tube? It starts forming somites, right? Remember that. Then if you go a little bit lateral to that, you have the intermediate mesoderm, right? Our intermediate mesoderm. And then the last one is you have these two layers here, which is gonna be called your, so you have this one here, and then this one here, this is actually gonna make what? This will make your lateral plate mesoderm. So your lateral plate mesoderm. Okay, and then again, you have two layers. It's plankton layer and somatic layer. Good. What I want us to do now is start talking about the muscles of the trunk. So what I want us to do is take this neural tube and these actual paraxial mesoderm chunks and just yank this out here and just zoom in only on that neural tube and on the paraxial mesoderm on the sides of it. Let's just focus on that portion. So really, I only want us to look right here. Okay, so here we have our neural tube, here we have our notochord, and on the sides, what do we have? Let's actually abbreviate it. This is our paraxial mesoderm, paraxial mesoderm. Here's our neural tube, and then this is our notochord, that black dot there, right? Remember what happens to the actual paraxial mesoderm. What do we say? It undergoes the somite formation, right? So somites are these little chunks, right? So if you imagine here, imagine here you had a neural tube, okay? What happens is you have these actual paraxial mesoderm chunks on the side. What they start doing is they start actually kind of like forming from a cranial, so let's say here's cranial end, and here's your caudal end. These start forming about three of them per day. And you generally get about 44 to 45 of these um, by week five. But these kind of like little chunks of mesoderm are called your somites, and they're gonna form on the sides of your neural tube. What happens is if we look at just one of these actual somites, you form a little space in it. This little space in it is called a somatocele. So this is a somite, but it becomes, again, having a little space in it, it has what's called a somatocele. And again, this is called a somite. And again, there's about 44 to 45 of these sons of guns that go and they actually form from cranial to caudal fashion, about three per day. Now, what happens is this somite has a somatocele that continues to keep expanding. And as it continues to keep expanding, it actually kind of cuts this somite into two portions. One is this dorsal portion back here, right? Because here's our neural tube. Here's our notochord. This is the dorsal portion. This is going to be what's called the dermatomyotome. And then this ventral portion here is going to be called the sclerotome. What happens is the dermatomyotome differentiates even more. It cuts up into two pieces. Now you have this most dorsal portion here called the dermatotome. I'm sorry, dermatome. And then you have the next middle layer here called your myotome. And then you have the most inner layer, the ventral layer here, which is called your sclerotome. But we're gonna go another, we're gonna go one more. Now I'm gonna have another layer form between the myotome. So again, what is this one here? Most dorsal is your dermatome. Think about this in uh, superficial to deep is the easiest way to remember it. What do you have? Obviously you have epidermis. So if you really wanted to think about it, obviously right here you would have ectoderm. So that's gonna make your epidermis, right? So this would make your epidermis. What's underneath your epidermis? Your dermis, that's your dermatome. What's underneath the actual dermis? Your myotome your muscle. What connects, so what's your, uh, this most inner layer here? We said this one. This was the sclerotome. What do we say sclerotome makes? Bones, cartilage, stuff like that, right? What connects bones to muscle? 
tendons. Here, this most kind of like intermediate layer between the myotome and the sclerotome is called your syndotome. Your syndotome is gonna be what makes your tendons. So we took this paraxial mesoderm and from that made how many layers from superficial to deep, if you'd like to think about it, or from dorsal to ventral, dermatome, myotome, syndotome, sclerotome. Beautiful. Now what I wanna do is, in an orderly fashion, recap you guys', me guys memory, go from the sclerotome all the way to the dermatome, primarily focusing on the myotome and syndotome along the way, all right? So let's recap you guys' memory. What do we say happens with the sclerotome? We know it goes through that whole resegmentation process to form intervertebral uh, spaces for the spinal nerves to run through. But what happens is, remember the sclerotome starts kind of wrapping around the neural tube. And what does it do? Forms the vertebral body, the vertebral arches, the spinous processes, the transverse processes, and the ribs. So now what do we got? Come down here, look. From this, our sclerotome is now gone. We're gonna kind of delete things as we go. Why? Because what does it become? We already talked about this in the development of the skeletal system. It's gonna become, in short, your vertebrae. Right? And we already talked about the vertebral arches, spinous, transverse processes, and body. It's also gonna become the intervertebral disc. We're gonna abbreviate this, intervertebral discs. And it's gonna become the ribs, which start off as the costal processes and then become the ribs, right? Now, that's the first thing. Now, let's do the next layer. So we're gonna abbreviate these just with the letter, right? So this is your dermatome, myotome, syndotome, okay? Let's put Y here just so that we don't confuse with the sclerotome. So again, dermatome, myotome, syndotome. Now, let's take this next thing and take the syndotome and start making tendons that are gonna connect bone to the next layer, myotome. So now look, if we follow this over here, now the syndotome is gonna form into tendons. So if we look here, we're gonna have our bones, right? So here's gonna be our vertebrae. Here's gonna be the ribs. Look what we started doing. The syndotome is now going to make all of this tendons. And we're just gonna kind of put tendons here and we're gonna put some tendons here, right? Along the ribs, along the vertebral bodies, all that stuff like that, because that's gonna be an attachment for muscles. So now what did we do here? We formed tendons. And again, why are tendons important? Because what do tendons connect? They connect muscle to bone. Here's our bone, what's the next layer? Before we go through that, I need you to remember something. Again, what was this layer here? Dermatome. What was this layer here? Myotome. Now, I want us to now cut this myotome in half. Let's do it with this blue marker. I'm gonna cut this in half. And on one half here in pink, this part here is gonna be the dorsal and more medial portion of that myotome. And then in green here, you're gonna have this more ventral and lateral aspect of the myotome. Why am I stressing on this? Why am I harping on this? Here's why. The, if we take a chunk here, okay, and again, we're gonna draw a line down the middle here. And let's say that this is going to be, again, dorsal, medial, ventral, lateral. Color coordinate here, green for that ventral lateral portion here, and then pink for this dorsal medial portion here. This dorsal medial portion is gonna just only move into the muscles around the back. So this is only going to form the muscles of the back. We'll talk about this in a little bit, but this is gonna make what's called your ep Epiaxial muscles, epiaxial muscles. And then this ventral lateral portion of the myotome is going to form what's called the hypaxial muscles. Now, I'll explain what that means in a second. But again, what I want you to think about here is in the form of migration. This portion here is gonna move all right here. And then these ones are gonna move out here to where the actual ribs are, and then out into the limbs, okay? So that is really important for you guys to remember. So again, 
When we talk about the myotome, the ventral lateral layer is gonna go out and make hypaxial muscles, and the dorsal medial layer is gonna just move dorsally and form the epiaxial muscles. Now, let's take that now. Let's go to the next step, remove the myotome, form those muscles of epaxial and hypaxial muscles on the next diagram. Let's come up. All right, so now let's take a look here. Okay, we got rid of the actual myotome, right? And the myotome did what? It formed epiaxial muscles, which are gonna be these muscles right here. So you see how this chunk of muscle here, we're gonna have the dermatome here in a second, but here, this whole thing here is gonna be what's called your epiaxial muscles. We'll talk about what these are, but these are gonna be the muscles that form the muscles of the back, okay? Then you're gonna have these other muscles called the hypaxial muscles. And the hypaxial muscles are gonna be the ones that form the muscles of the trunk and will even invade into the limbs and make the limbs, uh, the muscles of the limbs. We'll talk about that in a second. But again, we had the uh, syndotome form the tendons, the myotome formed the epaxial muscles, so the muscles here around the vertebrae, and then the hypaxial muscles, which are around the ribs, right? And will go out into the limbs. Now, let's just kind of, for simplicity's sake here, what do we have as a layer above this? Just we'll do a different color so we don't confuse here. What was this layer that was remaining? This is the dermatome, right? The dermatome is gonna do what? Invade this area. And what is that gonna become? The dermis, which is this kind of red layer here, and the green, which is the subcutaneous tissue. So if we got rid of that one, so again, here's gonna be the myotome forming these epiaxial muscles, hypaxial muscles, and then what I'm gonna do is just so you understand what happened to the dermatome, we're now gonna take that dermatome and move that where? It's gonna move outwards underneath the ectoderm and make what tissues here? It's gonna make the dermis, and it's gonna make the sub-Q. Cool, right? And then what's the ectoderm gonna make? The epidermis. So we see how we make the muscles of our trunk, whether it be the back or the ventral lateral portion here. Let's now kind of refine what epaxial muscles and hypaxial muscles are. Okay, so if we talk about the epiaxial muscles, these were the ones that were formed by what portion? The dorsal medial portion of the myotome. These are making muscles of the back. So I want you to remember back muscles. Okay, so I want you to remember the back muscles. So if you wanted some of these, remember like your erector spinae. So these are gonna become some of the muscles called the erector spinae. These will become some of the really deep muscles um, within the spine called the multifidi, multifidi. And then you also have another one called the rotaries. You'll also have some other muscles which are gonna be towards like the top, like your semispinalis, spinalis capitis. And then if you really want to go the extra mile, you even have some of those suboccipital muscles. So those recto, rectus muscles and then the obliquus muscles there. So you even have some of that, those suboccipital muscles as well. Okay, so these are going to be forming basically the muscles that are surrounding the vertebrae all the way from the actual base of the skull down until you get to that actual pelvic girdle. Pretty cool, right? The hypaxial muscles, what do we say? That was the ventral lateral portion that moved outwards and formed some of the muscles around the ribs, which are part of the trunk, and then even, even did what? Moved out into the limbs. We'll talk about that in the next section. But if you think about the hypaxial muscles, I want you to remember trunk. But particularly what portion? The ventral and the lateral trunk, because the back is pretty much the dorsal trunk if you want to think about it like that, right? So what are some of the muscles that surround your ribs? Pretty straightforward, right? What is the muscle that connects to the ribs and pretty much controls your breathing? Your diaphragm, right? So your diaphragm, <laughs> it's the only way I can spell it, right? So your diaphragm. The other ones is your intercostal muscles, your external, internal, intercostal muscles. So your intercostals, those are some other bad boys there, right? right? And your serratus, your serratus anterior and posterior, they connect to the ribs, right? So your serratus muscles, and then your abdominal muscles. Okay, your abdominal muscles. Those are also gonna be derived from the hypaxial version, right? So your abdominal muscles, what are some of those? Your transversus abdominis, your internal, external obliques, all those are derived from the hypaxial portion. And then again, what we're gonna talk about next is the limbs, your upper limbs, right? <laughs> Pretty straightforward, but might as well write it in the lower limbs, okay? 
So, so far we've talked about the development of the epiaxial portion and the hypaxial portion, which is all coming from what aspect of the mesoderm? The paraxial mesoderm. What component of the paraxial mesoderm? The myotome. Epiaxial from the dorsal medial, uh, hypaxial from the ventral lateral. So now we've talked about the muscles of the head. We talked about the muscles of the suprahyoid. Add on just a, a teensy bit more because I want to just make sure that we also don't confuse. Hypaxial muscles, a couple other ones that you could add into this to kind of fill the gaps here is we said what was remaining that we didn't cover in the head and neck. Infrahyoid. So the hypaxial muscles will also cover some of those infrahyoid muscles and some of those strap muscles, sternocleidomastoid, the scalene muscles, all those guys there. And then the muscles uh, basically around your girdles are going to be coming from this actual hypaxial muscles, and we'll talk about those a teensy bit when we get into the limbs. So we now know how we form the muscles of the head, neck, and trunk. Let's hit it hard with the limbs. All right, so we've talked about the trunk, we hit the head, and we hit the neck. All right, so we pretty much, if you think about it, hit all the axial musculature. Now let's hit the appendicular musculature. So it's kind of going back to that skeletal system. If you guys remember, we had to kind of form the limb buds. And we're not gonna go through all this too much, I just want you to remember, what were those genes involved in the limb buds? Your Hox genes, your TBX4, your TBX5 genes. And there's gonna be other things like your fibroblast growth factor that has to be produced as well, type 10. So all of these genes need to be activated in order for these limb buds to find their proper position as well as for them to initiate and induce this process of limb bud formation. Now, if you guys, I don't know if we talked about this in the skeletal system one, but the limb buds generally derive around C5 to T1 region, and then L2 to about S3 region is where your limb buds form. So upper limb bud, we're gonna abbreviate, and lower limb buds, okay? So, if you guys remember, Okay, from the development of the skeletal system. We have our limb bud here. Do you guys remember that at the edge of the limb bud, what did we have kind of coming out here? This is all ectoderm, all this blue is ectoderm. But at the tip of this ectoderm, this limb bud, we had what's called the apical ectodermal ridge. This was an area that was releasing a lot of fibroblast growth factors and triggering the lateral plate mesoderm. Do you guys remember what happened with that lateral plate mesoderm? The lateral plate mesoderm invaded which portion? Remember this was the splanchnic? Somatic. The somatic layer of the lateral plate mesoderm invaded this limb bud. And that apical ectodermal ridge was stimulating this to proliferate, proliferate, proliferate and form what's called that progress zone. And then this, the mesoderm that was far away from the apical ectodermal ridge underwent differentiation and made bone eventually, right? So we've already covered that. So now what I want us to do is just take this portion of the limb bud, we're just gonna take this upper limb bud and zoom in on it. And now actually that we've already formed the bones and we've already talked about that, now let's lay on our layers here, okay? So focusing in on this limb, we've already had our apical ectodermal ridge drive the proximal to distal formation. We've already had the zone of polarizing activity guide the anterior to posterior development, and then you have that ventral and dorsal ectoderm that guide the dorsal ventral surfaces. Boom. Now that we have our bones laid down, okay, what did that come from? Let's remember, I don't want you guys to forget the layers. What did the bones and cartilage come from? That came from this layer. What was this layer here called? We're gonna abbreviate it, lateral plate mesoderm. And this was which part of the lateral plate mesoderm? This was the somatic layer. That formed the bones and cartilage of the limb. Then, come back here, what, let's abbreviate these. Dermatome was the most dorsal, myotome, then you had your syndotome, so dermatome, myotome, syndotome, and then what was this one? Let's put SY, and then SC for sclerotome. We don't need the sclerotome, because that formed the vertebrae, the ribs, all that stuff there. What, we, what do we need next? We've already formed the bones. That came from the lateral plate mesoderm. Now what I need to do is, I need to lay down a particular tissue that connects bones to muscle. What did that come from? The syndotome. So now what I need is, I need the syndotome layer to start migrating and move into this actual limb bud. And when it does that, guess what this actual syndotome does? So this is gonna be what happens in this step. The syndotome 
migrates. So the mesenchymal cells from the actual syndetome migrate into the limb bud. And what do we say the syndetome makes? Tendons. So now, we laid our bony layer here, first with the lateral plate mesoderm, somatic layer. Now what have we laid down next? Our tendons. And we did that with the syndetome, coming from the paraxial mesoderm. So again, what is this orange stuff here? Tendons. Now that we've laid the tendons down, what's the next layer to start feeding in here? The next layer is this one. So we hit the syndetome. Now we got to hit this one, which is our myotome. So what happens is this myotome starts migrating and it migrates into this portion here, into this portion here. And once this myotome migrates in here, we have this myotome migration. So what now just happened? We had syndetome migration. Now we're having myotome migration. Myotome migration. This does something very interesting. When the myotome migrates into this, let's think about this. Thumb here and then the pinky here. Okay, generally when you're developing, okay, in the embryo, the thumbs are anterior, okay, so the thumbs would be anterior and the pinkies would be posterior. So there's a reason why I'm telling you that. The myotome migrates into this kind of uh, anterior portion and migrates into this posterior portion. And when it does, it just forms kind of chunks of muscles, non-specific. It's just a chunk of muscle on the anterior portion and a chunk of muscle on the posterior portion in this limb bud. We call this chunk of muscle in the anterior portion of the limb bud, the anterior condensation. And then we call this chunk of muscles that are actually uh, from the myotome migration in the posterior aspect, <laughs> I know you guessed it, the posterior condensation. That is important because eventually, and we'll talk about in a second, the anterior condensation will do what? Will form particular muscles. They'll actually start differentiating and really becoming more specialized and become muscles that are very specific in the arm or legs. The last thing I wanna make sure that you guys know is we've covered in order, lateral plate mesoderm somatic layer made the bones and cartilage. The syndetome made the, t the actual tendons. The myotome made the anterior condensation and posterior condensation. What will the dermatome do? It will make the dermis and subcutaneous tissue. That will all go all around this area here, right? So that's pretty straightforward. Now, let's talk about what this anterior and posterior condensation are a little bit more. All right, so we talked about how these muscles, the myotome invades the limb bud, right? And forms this anterior posterior condensation. I want us to dig just a little bit more into that and then kind of elaborate more on that. There's a reason why, because they're, they, they're embryologically derived to be functionally different in the upper and lower limbs, right? So let's say here we talk about the upper limb Right, so the anterior condensation of the upper limb and then the anterior condensation of the lower limb. And let's just be simplistic. Let's think about it logically. Myotome invades into the upper limb. All the muscles, let's start here. Let's start here at the actual upper arm. What does these muscles do? They flex, they flex at the elbow. What do these muscles do? They flex. There's another group of muscles right here. What do they do? They help with pronation. Pronation. So the anterior condensation for the upper limb will make what kind of muscles? Flexors and what else? Pronators. For the, uh, the next aspect here, for the lower limb, think about it. Keep it just simple. If you move here, your quads, what are they doing? They're playing a role in extension. What is the actual muscles of your lower leg doing? They're playing a role in what kind of aspect here? dorsiflexion. And then on the inner aspect, what do you have in here? Your adductors. So if you think about just anterior compartment, that makes it pretty simple here where you have extensors. It's also going to make what's called adductors. This is kind of for the upper aspect of the, uh, the lower limb. And then the most lower leg portion will be your dorsiflexors. 
pretty cool, right? How the embryologically they lead to functional differences in, in the adult. I think that's pretty cool. From ninja to nerd, make sure you guys comment. How cool is this, all right? All right, next thing. All right, so now the posterior condensation. Same concept here. You got your upper limb. Okay, so these myotome uh, migration into the uh, upper limb will produce different types of muscle function. And then lower limb, same concept here. Think about this, upper limb, you got the muscles invading all this posterior portion here. Triceps, what are they doing? They're extending. And then you also are going to have these muscles which are gonna extend like your wrist and digits. But then you have some really deep muscles that help with being able to kind of do this kind of motion called supination. So with your upper limb, the posterior condensation plays a role in what's called supination, and it's also going to help with the muscles that are going to be uh, functional for extension. And then when you think about the muscles of the lower limb and the back, the hammies, what are those going to be doing? Flexing. Okay, so they play a role with flexion at the knee. And then you have the muscles of the calf, those are important for plantar flexion. Right, so they play a role in plantar flexion. And then don't forget about those muscles that go around the outside, right? That are gonna be kind of the gluteus, some of those deep muscles. Those are also gonna be helpful for abduction. Okay, so abduction. That is why I really wanted you guys to understand is not to just know the muscles of the limbs, but to know how embryologically they lead to functional differences in the adult and, and even in the child. So that's pretty darn cool. All right, so we talked about this for bone formation. I wanna kinda of cover the same concept with muscles. So remember what we pretty much derived all the muscles from, mesoderm, right? Whether it was paraxial, whether it was lateral plate mesoderm, or whether it was from the mesoderm from the um, pharyngeal arches. All of it, for the most part, was mesoderm. Well, mesoderm, again, goes from epithelial cells to mesenchymal cells. It's called epithelial to mesenchymal kind of like transition. And these mesenchymal cells, or mesenchymal cells, however you like to call them, they have to start kind of differentiating, right, and becoming particular types of cells that are destined to become muscles. And these are called your myoblasts your myoblasts, and then eventually what happens is your myoblasts will start fusing together. You'll get these myoblasts, and they'll fuse together, and they'll form like these muscle fibers. Okay, they'll form these muscle fibers. And then what happens is a bunch of muscle fibers, you see how you have nucleated, single nucleated cells? These muscle fibers fuse with more muscle fibers, and eventually you just get a big chunk of muscle, right? In order for us to go from these mesenchymal cells or mesenchymal cells to this actual muscle cell differentiation, we need particular genes to be activated for us to differentiate and have this different phenotype. And these genes, let's say, that are involved in this process are very specific, actually. Um, so generally, the first genes that become activated for kind of leading to these muscle uh, differentiation are called your Pax genes. So these Pax genes need to be activated. But Pax genes will then activate another set of genes. They'll activate genes that are called MyoD and another one called MYF. Okay, and there's like four and five. And then these genes will become activated and they'll lead to the activation of what's called myogenin. And myogenin is what really gives that different muscle cell difference. And why is muscle cells different? Well, they have different proteins, actin, myosin, troponin, tropomyosin. All of that is dependent upon this gene activation and differentiation process. So again, we know that when we go from mesenchymal cells to muscle cells, we have to activate certain types of genes to lead to those particular muscle proteins to be expressed and be phenotypically different. All right, so that covers everything we need to know about the development of the muscular system. All right, engineers, so in this video, we covered the development of the muscular system. I hope it made sense, and I really hope that you guys enjoyed it. If you guys did, please continue to support us in any way that you can. Engineers, we love you, we thank you, and as always, until next time.